The Lord be with you. This is Pastor Larson with Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. Do all Christians agree in their teachings about the Lord's Supper? Do Lutherans reject some of those teachings? Uh, let's look at that today as we continue with our Bible study here on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Uh, no, it's at 930. And I hope you got the time change that our Bible class begins online at 930. We welcome you to worship with us at 830 and 1030, either online or at our church at 400 North Swinton in Delray Beach, Florida. Well, good morning to you. It's morning where we are. Uh, the unfortunate circumstance is that over the centuries, Christians have not always agreed on what they believe. They do not agree with one another about baptism and about the doctrine of election, God's choice to bring us to faith in his son, Jesus. And they do not always agree on the Lord's Supper, which is our topic for now. And uh, that's what we want to go into more deeply today. Christian leaders, those who were teachers in the church, have often differed. And they continue to differ and teach differently about the Lord's Supper, what it is and how we receive it and what we receive. So we can study this together and contrast what others teach with what we teach in the Lutheran Church. I think one way to do that is to go back a few centuries and study those who were doing the teaching. In fact, we'll be going back about five centuries today, and I hope that's okay with you. We did this last week studying Martin Luther, Ulrich Zwingli, and John Calvin. And I dug up some pictures that I find on Google Images and, and put their, their pictures there for you. Um, these were paintings at the time. So we have Martin Luther and Zwingli and Calvin. They were all teachers in the church. They were very learned. They wrote in German and in Latin and uh, in, in French. Uh, Zwingli and Calvin have uh, come out of uh, Switzerland. And there's a lot to be learned about their personal history. You can look that up for yourselves, I'm sure. Uh, there are differences in the teaching of the Lord's Supper. Um, I have to know if you're getting this. Um, well, I guess uh, what I have needed to do. That's better, isn't it? There's difference in their teachings. Okay. Uh, who were, were we talking about? These people who are pictured here, Martin Luther and Ulrich Zwingli and John Calvin. I'm sorry about not sharing the screen right away. That's okay. The um, differences in teaching. You have a question? Okay. They agreed uh, on many things, including that they all agreed that Jesus wanted us to celebrate the Lord's Supper. They talked about how often, and they didn't always agree on how often, that a church, a congregation, should celebrate the Lord's Supper, but they did agree that Jesus wanted it done when he took bread and said, this is my body. And when he, after the bread, took a cup of wine and said, this is my blood of the New Testament. But they disagreed. They disagreed hmm. uh, regarding the meaning of Jesus. The meaning of Jesus' words. This is my body. This is my blood. I'll pause for your questions if you have any. No. All right, we can go on. Well, there's an apple, and you can describe it. Remember last time we were together, 
I talked about the terms yeah. that we can use. Uh, and I hope I didn't confuse you. One is the accidental properties of the apple, and the other is the substance, the apple itself. Now, that is not an apple. That is a picture of an apple. But if I had an actual apple here, I would show you that, and that would appear on your screen. But what appeared on your screen would not be an apple. It could not be. What you would see is the accidental properties of the apple, including its shape and its color. So, for example, the accidental properties are that the apple is red and round and sweet, or in some cases, very sour. Uh, I am feeling a stomach ache when I think about eating a sour apple. <laughs> but uh, if you want a good mm -hmm. apple pie, all right, but the substance of the apple is the thing itself, that which you hold in your hand. Okay, now the weight of the apple would be one of its accidental properties. But the apple itself is the substance. Don't think of substance as uh, the pulp or the seeds, but the thing itself. That is a hard concept for me, and maybe it is for, for you as well. Okay with that? Mm -hmm. Now I want to apply this to the Lord's Supper. There is the chalice containing the wine, and there is a, the, the bread. And often in our churches, it is a wafer, and the only ingredient in the wafer is wheat. Okay? Didn't know that. You can make them. So there is bread, and there is wine in the Lord's Supper. The accidental properties are the taste and the color and the texture. In the case of the uh, wine, there's an aroma, usually. <clears throat> the sweetness. And the substance is the reality. The bread itself and the wine itself. And again, the idea of substance is hard. You know, it's a philosophical term. And, you know, I'm kind of an engineer. Uh, I'm kind of a rational being most of the time, and it's very hard for me to wrap my mind around these these uh, philosophical terms. And you may be having that problem, but let's apply them. Pastor, could we stop here a second? Because now, now that you said that the accidental properties are taste, color, texture, and aroma, that didn't fit with my accidental picture of an apple. There. Accidental doesn't mean I ran into a, a fence post when I was walking. It's a philosophical term, which meant the properties of a given object or oh. person. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm brown and I'm round. And most of the time, I try to be sweet to my wife. <laughs> Those are my accidental properties. All right. I'm not, I may, I'm probably not helping. Chris? Yeah, well, that did help me a bit because properties, I didn't write down properties. I, I missed that. Okay. So, substance does not have properties. Mm, well, you might say that every substance has various properties but they, yeah. they are not part of the substance. Now that didn't, that didn't go down well. Oh. Just separate <laughs> the thing itself from adjectives that describe the thing. Okay. Maybe uh, instead of accidental, we would use the word um, adjectives and that would help. Uh-huh, because uh, accidental, no, because it's not the real thing. It's just describing it. That's good. Yeah. Descriptive. Descriptors. To use another word. All right. Yeah. There's there's the bread and the wine in the Lord's Supper, and it has these descriptive adjectives. Color, taste, texture, 
aroma. And the substance is the wine and the bread itself. Okay. Now, the reason I bring these up at all is to talk about the Roman Catholic definition of transubstantiation. Maybe you've heard about this before, that when the priest says the word, they become, we don't in the Lutheran Church use the word become. But in the Roman Catholic Church, the wine and the bread become the body and blood of Jesus. The substance itself is changed into body. The wine itself is changed into blood. But get this, the descriptors, the adjectives, the accidental qualities or properties, they remain the same. Now, that's harder for me to get down uh, in my uh, thinking process, but that's what they officially teach in the Roman Catholic Church. Not every Roman Catholic parishioner believes that, but this is the teaching in the catechism. And we can get the, you can get the Roman Catholic catechism off the internet and get the complete thing. It's rather long, and I'm going to quote from it if we get that far. All right. Okay. Substance, it <clears throat> changed. Transubstantiation, you see? Substance here, transubstantiation. And they made up that term. It's not in the Bible. Okay. They made up the term in order to describe what they believe happens. All right. Now, Luther and Zwingli and Calvin, those three influential Christian leaders of the 16th century, they all were agreed, they all rejected the Roman Catholic teaching that the bread and wine are changed. All right. But they differed with one another on how Christ or if Christ was present. And they differed about what they meant by his being present. Now, sometimes the people who write about this since then uh, say they differed about the mode of Christ's presence. And, well, you may not like the word mode. But yeah. I don't. Uh, I'll just stick with how. How you describe his presence. Right. But this is where Luther and Zwingli and Calvin uh, differed. In fact, at one point, uh, Luther and Zwingli sat down at a table and talked about this, and they found out that they agreed on many things. But when mm -hmm. they got to this teaching, they found a difference that they could not reconcile, and they left the meeting, both of them disappointed. All right? Now, I want to do something that I haven't done, but maybe once. And I'm going to take the a brief six minute portion of a presentation made by uh, the seminary president, Dr. Lawrence Rast. Okay. He is also a professor and has been at the seminary for 15 to 20 years. I did not have him for a professor. In fact, he was a student at that seminary that I attended a few years after I left. But um, he is a very good leader, and I think you will um, enjoy this. Listen carefully, because he is going to use some of the same terms that we have been talking about. And as I say, it's about six minutes long. Okay. And, um, what are we... Uh, we're only 15 minutes into the session today, okay. so I'm going to stop this share, okay. and I'm going to share another screen, okay. and there you see his face. Dr. Rast is right in the middle of a paragraph, and we're going to pick him up at 2 minutes and 30 seconds into this, okay. and please tell me if you have any trouble hearing this, because I can change the volume. All right, Dr. Rast, please go on.
Ulrich Zwingli was enormously important for the development of the reform tradition through. Can you hear that okay? Yes. His yes. work first as a priest and then as a reformer in, Zur in Zurich, Switzerland. There he articulated the principle, formal principle, of scripture alone over against the Roman Catholic threefold tradition. Zwingli said, we'll use scripture and nothing more to develop our position. As he pursued that formal principle, what came out of it were increasing concerns. We lost it. Yeah. Pastor Larson, we've lost it. Yeah, he's probably trying to get it back. Oh, okay. And Pastor Larson, you, yeah. yeah. I think we I, I muted myself because I'm not going to talk over Dr. Rast. But we can't hear him. You couldn't hear him? No. no. Well. It, uh, uh, maybe it's coming through my microphone. Okay, I can do this again. Yeah, you can't mute yourself. That's what I. Mm. All right, let's try this. Tradition through his work first as a priest and then as a reformer in, Zur in Zurich, Switzerland. Could you hear that? Yeah. Yes. There he articulated the principle, formal principle of scripture alone over against the Roman Catholic threefold tradition. Zwingli said, we'll use scripture and nothing more to develop our position. As he pursued that formal principle, what came out of it were increasing concerns over a variety of Roman Catholic teachings. In fact, he went so far as to say that the teaching regarding the real presence of Christ in the sacrament of the altar was in fact erroneous. This would lead to some real crisis points with the Lutherans. Now it's true, Lutherans and Roman Catholics had some important differences in regard to the real presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper. While they both accepted it, the means of that presence or the mode of that presence was understood very differently. Roman Catholics believed in transubstantiation. That is, by virtue of the priestly action of speaking the verba, hoc, et, hoc est corpus meum, that the bread in the sacrament was literally changed into the body of Christ. And while the accidents remained, the substance had changed. While it still looked and tasted like bread, it had actually become only the body of Christ. The same thing mm -hmm. being true of the chalice and the wine at hell. That being transubstantiated into the, blo the uh, blood of Christ. There no longer being any wine present, though the accidents, taste, and smell of wine remained. Luther disagreed, arguing instead for a sacramental presence of Christ. Oftentimes we express that in terms of in, with, and under the forms of bread and wine. Zwingli found both of these positions problematic and in fact said the supper of the Lord is primarily symbolical and by virtue of the representation of the bread and wine that evokes in our minds a cognitive process that creates a kind of memory. Now there's a presence of sort of Christ in that memory but in the end it is simply that cognitive process, not a real presence of the glorified Christ. As a result, when Luther and the Zwinglians met in 1529 at the Marburg Colloquy, they could not come to agreement on that point. They agreed on many other things, but on that point, they remained divided. Zwingli himself would die two years later in 1531 in battle against the Roman Catholics. And at that point, leadership in the Reformed tradition was in something of a vacuum state. Who would fill Zwingli's shoes? The man who did was John Calvin. Mm -hmm. Calvin articulated a theological position already in 1536 in his most famous work, The Institutes, Institutes of the Christian Religion. 
He revised that book several times over the course of his remaining life. And in fact, it grew and became larger over time and continues to be an important resource for understanding the Reformed tradition. Now with Calvin, there's a little bit of different emphasis that you find on two particular points. It's true. He would say the formal principle, the basis for everything he believed, taught, confessed, would be the scriptures. So once again, formal principle being sola scriptura. But the manner in which then he drew forth from that scripture led him to some different conclusions. For example, when it came to the question of the Lord's Supper and the presence of Christ in the sacrament, a burning issue between Reformed and Lutherans, and certainly between Protestants and Catholics, Calvin offered a different explanation than Zwingli had, and it's important to keep these two clear. Where Zwingli largely focused on the symbolic representation, Calvin talked about a spiritual presence. A real spiritual presence, perhaps a spiritual real presence. Nonetheless, Calvin would say that by virtue of participation in the dominical meal established by the Lord himself, our faith is excited and drawn up to heaven where we feed upon Christ in our hearts by faith. It is a real participation of the believer with Christ feeding upon him, but it happens primarily spiritually through faith. Hmm. In some ways, you might think that Calvin was trying to shoot the gap, if you will, between Zwingli's more representative approach and Luther's more real sacramental approach. You might say he was trying to have his cake and eat it too. Nonetheless, the Lutherans never found this satisfying, this explanation of Calvin satisfying, saying that it still compromised the clear words of Scripture, this is my body, and that it was unnecessarily philosophical and confusing and really didn't communicate well to the common people. Better, said the Lutherans, to take Christ at his word. When Christ says, this is my body, it is indeed. This is my blood, it is indeed. I'll take him off of there and ask you if you have any questions or comments about Dr. Rass' presentation. He's a good speaker. Yeah. Well, Luther Luther did say that we have to receive it by faith, and uh, and and that's what he just said, uh, Calvin. Uh, that's the spiritual presence, uh, and we receive it by faith. Um, Luther said that he who is truly worthy to receive the sacrament is the one who has faith in, in these words given and shed for you for the remission of sins. That is different from Calvin. Luther believed, and so do we, believe and teach and confess in the Lutheran Church that we receive the body and blood of Christ in, with, and under the bread and the wine. We don't receive the bread and the wine, oh, excuse me, we don't receive the body and blood of Christ spiritually as Calvin taught. We really do receive Christ. That is contrary to reason, but it is faithful to the scriptures. Faith is involved in both of their explanations but it's faith in a different way. Luther and Calvin disagreed uh, on the mode of Christ's presence in the reception. Okay, does that help, Evelyn? I'm, uh, I'm really confused, <laughs> sorry. No, it may be because I have used too many words. Go back to Matthew 26, where Jesus gives you the words. This is my body. Right. And though we don't know how it can be, we believe it, what Christ said is literally true. Uh, why did that happen? Okay. 
Now go back and read in the Lutheran Confessions uh, what we have been talking about. There is an article in the Formula of Concord on the Lord's Supper. At the moment, I don't recall what number it is. Uh, but you can read it there. There are a lot of words, but it, you're going to the heart of the controversy because the Formula of Concord was written in 1577. And it was one of the things that Lutherans had had some uh, great discussions on. The Formula of Concord was a means of bringing the Lutherans back together around one teaching on the basis of scripture. And we're constantly doing that when we teach in the church. I think the best thing for all of us is to read the small catechism because there what Christ teaches is distilled into a, a very small number of words. That's true. It is. Theologians um, love to use many words <laughs> in Latin and German and French and all <laughs> The languages of uh, of their literature. Okay. Any other comments or questions? No. I'm going back to this, and uh, go on to the next uh, slide. Um, okay. A pastor, <clears throat> that goes back to last week. I asked about uh, when he told the people out of. Jesus told people that this was his flesh and they left saying, but that was also an indication that it was real. I mean, it wasn't a representation. That's a good point. You're reading in John chapter six. Okay. Which is not the institution of the Lord's Supper, um, yeah. but in a way it prefigured what was going to happen on the mm -hmm. night in which he was betrayed, the night before the crucifixion. Okay, the differences in teachings are not minor, but they are clear. Luther taught and we believe that communis, communicants, that's us, we receive both bread and body, both wine and blood, in, with, and under. Now the reason Luther uses those prepositions is to cover all the bases, because he doesn't try to say how Christ is present and received. If you cannot describe it, don't. Just say, I receive it. And go back to the hymn that I was teaching you before, how this can be, I leave to thee, thy word alone sufficeth me. Go back and read the communion hymns in your hymnal. And also, you can find those on, on the internet, too. <clears throat> Zwingli taught that the bread and wine are symbols or signs of his presence. So he's not really present. He's not really received. The supper to Zwingli and all of his followers is a memorial of Christ's sacrifice a memorial a means by which we remember him okay a visual reminder of that sacrifice Zwingli's problem was a physical thing he said and we teach also that 40 days after Christ's ascent of uh, Christ's resurrection mm -hmm. he ascended into heaven to the right hand of God. And I looked that up several weeks ago and found that that is taught in nine different passages of the New Testament. So if Christ ascended to the right hand of God, he can't be present in the supper, said Zwingli. But I've taught you and the scriptures teach that the right hand of God is not a place. It's not a physical location. That Christ, according to his promise, is present everywhere. I will be with you always, and in other sentences of the New Testament. He is present. He is present according to his promise. This is my body, 
this is my blood. Take and eat, take and drink. Do not use your rational mind to try to figure it out. Zwingli <laughs> and Calvin had this in common, that they were using their rational mind to try to figure out the words of Christ. Okay. Calvin said worthy communicants outwardly partake of bread and wine. They receive Christ spiritually by faith. Now, those are my summary statements. You have to do a lot of more reading to find all that they said. But I wanted to boil it down to the least number of words that I could for you. Memorial, visual reminder. In this case of Calvin, spiritually by faith. Now, Evelyn, do you see how that is different from Luther's teaching? I'm just, I just wanted to ask you, I'm still not clear on the difference between Luther and Calvin. Calvin, it's yes. spiritually, I guess I'm not understanding spiritually. Right. Yeah. So Luther doesn't use the word spiritually. He says, and actually, we do receive the body and blood of Christ. And our faith takes hold oh. of what Christ said. Okay. Our faith okay. does not create his presence, neither in our mind or our hearts. He is present. Mm -hmm. It's an objective reality. Now, suppose uh, someone comes to the supper and doesn't believe what Jesus taught. All right. But they do receive bread and wine. Do they receive his body and blood? No. Wait, wait a minute before you answer. What makes his present, his presence actually true? His words, not the faith of the recipient. So no. the recipient who does not discern the body, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 28, okay. the one who does not receive, uh, dis discern the body, takes and eats and drinks to his judgment. And that's why we make great importance on that, that you believe what you are receiving. It is not a spiritual thing for us. Oh, you might say that everything we do in the church is spiritual. That's not the kind of spiritual that we're talking about. Christ, uh, Calvin was using the word to escape from any actuality. I'm not really receiving, said Calvin, the body and blood of Christ. Oh. Okay, I'm only doing that in a, uh, a remembrance. A, my faith is taking hold of the Christ who is in heaven. He's not present in a physical sense. <coughs> you know, it might have to be that you go by this a few more times. And you remember, I do send this to you right after I get through here. I'm going to make a copy of it. So you can, you can print it or look at it on your screen again. All right. I'm not the best teacher uh, right now. I'm all you got in this Bible class. So you might find someone else who will do a better job. Okay. There are differences. There's something to be said here about the term real presence. The real presence of Christ is present. And when you talk about the real presence of Christ, there should be a comma there, or Christ is present, two ways of saying something. The different teachers use these terms with different meanings. If you go into a different denomination and ask, do you believe that Christ is truly present? They would say yes. And do you see how the word present is not an accurate description? Because it depends on what you mean by present. We believe that he is present and received. His true body and his true blood is received by all communicants. Right. So some will talk about the real presence or say Christ is really present, but they'll have a different meaning. 
in this difference that began with Calvin and Zwingli still exists in many church denominations today. Hmm. We have time. Um, I'll get into uh, what those differences were. All right. Okay. Uh, I got a long answer from from Judy that I'm not going to interrupt. No, I just wanted to look at it to see if something was urgent. It is not urgent. Okay. Okay. We have time to go on. We're going to contrast the differences in the various denominations, starting with the Roman Catholic. And here, those bracketed numbers are the numbering in the Baltimore Catechism, the Roman Catholic Catechism. So this is as official as I can get without going to Rome. <laughs> Roman Catholic teaching, the whole Christ is truly, really, and substantially substantially contained. It is by the conversion of the bread and wine into Christ's body and blood that Christ becomes present in this sacrament. And you see how the word present is used in a different way because they are talking about transubstantiation. Uh, take, take a look at that paragraph again, please. The whole Christ is true. conversion and that conversion they call transubstantiation okay. and there's more the same christ who offered himself once in a bloody manner on the altar of the cross is contained and is offered in an unbloody manner this sacrifice is truly propitiatory or propitiatory. What does that mean? That means it covers our sins. Oh. The priest is offering on the altar an unbloody sacrifice. We do not believe that. All our pastors are doing is setting aside the bread and the wine to give it to the communicants but no sacrifice is going on. That happened as the letter to the Hebrews says, once for all, and there is no more sacrifice to be done. It's offered for the faithful departed who have died in Christ, but are not yet wholly purified. And that is talking about purgatory. Oh. So sometimes masses are offered for the dead to help them along a few less years in purgatory. Hmm. I'm not going to teach purgatory this. No, it's not for here, but you can look it up. Maybe sometime we'll have a whole lesson on what Roman Catholics teach, but it would take a long time. Okay. So you see a grave difference between the Roman Catholic doctrine of the Lord's Supper and ours. Okay. Hmm. Now the Baptists, they descended from Calvin and Zwingli. So they say that the Lord's Supper is a symbolic act of obedience. So right away they make the gospel into a law. Hmm. The Lord's Supper is entirely a gospel thing. And they say in the Baptist church, and this is official, the Baptist faith and message, a writing done in the year 2000, symbolic act of obedience whereby members of the church through partaking of the bread and the fruit of the vine, they are careful not to say wine because most Baptist churches reject alcoholic beverages. <laughs> so some have grape juice. They memorialize the death of the redeemer and anticipate his second coming. Hmm. Okay, so they don't have the Lord's Supper. They call it the Lord's Supper, but they don't have the body and blood of Christ present and received for the forgiveness of sins. They just want to remember 
his sacrifice. The Methodist. In the Lord's Supper, Jesus Christ is present. See, that word is used again, but with a different meaning. Jesus Christ is present with his worshiping people and gives himself to them as their Lord and Savior. As they eat the bread and drink the wine, through the power of the Holy Spirit, they receive him by faith and with thanksgiving. Now, that doesn't mean they receive his body and blood, because he's not there. You see, that is, they're using words that we use, present and uh, receive, and the by faith idea that uh, we were talking about before. We say you receive Christ's body and blood whether you believe it or not, because it is not our faith that creates his presence, but his words spoken at uh, the night before he was crucified. Let's talk about the Episcopal Church, which is officially part of the Anglican Church, though there are differences. Okay, most of them in practice, not in doctrine. Now, a long time ago, they wrote their doctrinal book called the 39 Articles. They are very similar to our uh, Augsburg Confession. Hmm. That's another story. I just wanted to tell you that there, there is a connection between the English Reformation and the Lutheran Reformation. And it's partly through reading Luther that they developed their faith and wrote it down in these 39 Articles. So from paragraph 25, we're reading this in the Anglican Church. Sacraments ordained of Christ be not only badges or tokens of men's profession, but rather they be certain sure witnesses and effectual signs of grace and God's good will toward us, by the which he doth work invisibly in us and doth not only quicken, but also strengthen and confirm our faith in him. You want to study that for a moment? <laughs> Sacraments ordained of Christ. So the official teaching is not the real reception of Christ's body and blood, hmm. but they're witnesses and signs of grace. Well, I think we would say they are at least that, but a lot more. Right. It's kind of loose. That's a good word. Let's take one more. The Presbyterian Church is a descendant of Calvin, uh, the Reformed. The word Reformed is used to say Luther did a Reformation, but he didn't go far enough. That's not their official definition of Reformed. That is a Lutheran definition of Reformed. They got, they got more Reformation than Luther would uh, uh, have said. So they read from a thing called the Westminster Confession. In chapter 29, I'm going to take a deep breath, because this is long. Be patient. The Lord's Supper, perpetual remembrance of his sacrifice and death, and as the seal of all the benefits of that sacrifice, for true believers. It also signifies the spiritual nourishment and growth of believers in Jesus and their additional commitment to perform all the duties they owe him. No words like that in Luther. The bread and the wine in this sacrament only sacramentally, only sacramentally are called by the name of what they represent that is the body and blood of Christ. Even so, they still remain in substance and nature, only bread and wine, as they were before their sacramental use. So the Presbyterians, taking Calvin as their teacher, do have that great difference between themselves and Martin Luther, and all Lutherans descended from him. 
I'm going to take a moment to look at those words. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the difficulties of reading doctrinal things from the 16th century is they, they didn't seem to have a lot of periods. They liked commas and semicolons. Mm -hmm. And they, they went on and on and on in the, the, the Latin and in the French. So that's why you see my ellipses and you can read the entire Westminster Confession on the internet if you want to go and read it. It's pretty long. But you see the differences between Lutheran and Presbyterian. Okay. So in order to summarize it, you've seen something like this before, haven't you? Some more. Yeah, I, I've revised it a little bit. So what is received by Lutherans, Roman Catholics, and Reformed? Well, do Lutherans receive the bread and wine? Yes. yes. Do Lutherans receive the body and blood of Jesus? Yes. And the supper for Lutherans is the real, true presence of Christ. The Roman Catholics say, no, we do not receive bread and wine. It's no longer there. The accidents are there. It still looks like it, tastes like it. Mm -hmm. But we do receive the body and blood of Jesus. And this is a sacrifice. And the Reformed, following John Calvin, believe they do receive the bread and the wine. But no, 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 no. We do not receive the body and blood of Christ. And it's a memorial. Okay. Many times they will say, well, this reminds us of the feast that we will celebrate in heaven. Christ does not make that, that connection, but in the book of Revelation, you may find some references to that. Okay. We might actually finish before the hour is up today. That would be okay. Now, here is one way of drawing the descendants the descendants of Luther, of course, are the various Lutherans that are in the world today. Um, according to one statistic, there are about 80 million of us in the world. Not as many as Roman Catholics. Not near as many. There's over a billion Roman Catholics. Uh, here are Zwingli and Calvin. Now, Zwingli and Calvin both influenced the Reformed Church. The Calvin descendants are generally the Presbyterians. And descending from the Presbyterians are those who went a little further in the Reformed Church. Mm -hmm. For a very brief time in my life when I was a teenager, I attended the Christian Reformed Church in Michigan. It's a long story, but I'm not going to recite it today. I learned that they had 45 minute sermons. <laughs> well, they were a teaching church. Um, Calvin also influenced the United Church of Christ. And today I'm not going to be able to give you a definition or what, what the United Church of Christ is like, but they have some of Luther's teachings uh, influencing them. So this kind of uh, pedigree or uh, where did you come from is in a chart, something like this. And here is another chart that looks more complicated, but if you if, slow down and see it uh, one step at a time, it's not bad. Uh, and Jesus taught the apostles, in, including uh, St. Paul. And those uh, people formed the early church. The Coptic Christians uh, uh, came from there, and the Thomas Christians, which I don't know a lot about. Out of that uh, early church uh, came the Eastern Orthodox Christians, the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, and so forth. Coming out of the early church 
was the Western in, in the 11th century, there was a division between the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic, which is mostly a, hate to say it, a political division, but there were some doctrinal differences too. And they both fought for power. Which one would be the principal, uh, they use it, the word C, S-E-E, -E, uh, headquarters, I'll use that word, of the, of the official church. Well, Rome said, no, we're it. And out of that comes the Roman Catholic Church of today. But of course, in the 16th century, the Protestant Reformation occurred through many leaders, uh, three of which we've talked about today, Luther and Calvin and Zwingli. Here is Lutheran coming into the denomination Lutheran today. And also, some of you may have heard about the Evangelical Free Church. I have a very good a uh, uh, friend, you've heard me talk about Dale and Joyce. Uh, they no longer attend the Presbyterian Church, but now attend the and are members of the Evangelical Free Church. And they are uh, aware that uh, they have similarities with the Lutherans. I really have problems with my pointer. It doesn't seem to stay in the same place. Out of the, Pres of the Protestant Reformation comes the Reformed and the Presbyterian, which we talked about today, but also the Anabaptist. Who were the Anabaptists? They said, well, if you were baptized in, as an infant, that didn't count, didn't, didn't do anything. You have to be baptized again after you have come to faith in Christ. So the word Anabaptist, Anna means again. They were baptized again. And out of that comes the Mennonites and the Amish. Maybe you didn't know that before. The other branch of the Protestant Reformation is the Anglican, the, uh, the English Reformation, and out of them came uh, the Methodist and the Quakers and the Congregationalists and the Baptists. Now, that may be somewhat helpful if you meet someone from one of them and uh, those denominations and you kind of think about, well, where did uh, you come from and what do you believe? I'm not sure that it helps me a whole lot, except to realize that today's denominations came out of various differences that they discovered that they had with other teachers. You want to look at that a little bit? Boy, it's a big you have any questions? Obviously, we can't represent all denominations on there. There are about 15 to 20 different kinds of Lutherans. Right. There are more than that, different kinds of Baptists. There are Roman Catholics who say we um, are different from the Roman Catholic Church. There are many differences. In heaven, there will only be one church. There is only one church. As I've taught you before, the, the church is the collection of all true believers in Christ, and it doesn't have a name, and the only head is Christ. That may be helpful when you consider all the differences, the differences that do make a difference. It is not right to take hold of a doctrine and twist it to your own thinking. But after all the differences are uh, dissolved and only one true teacher, that is Christ himself. That is, that is um, something worth thinking about. All right. So I have time for your questions. If you have any today, please go ahead. I, I have more, but we uh, I'll send it to you. It is a slight, it is a small paragraph. Okay. Uh, no, I think I've given you everything. So now your questions.
we're still on the recording, but I invite you to talk about what anything you want to talk about. And we'll have a new study next week. Oh. I think you'll look forward to that. Are you going to tell us? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's tentative. And when I'm tentative, I don't like to commit myself because then you see, you promised we were going to do that. Well, I changed my mind. That's one thing I get to do. No one tells me what I must teach. But I remember what one of you said or someone who is not with us uh, moved away. Pastor, I would like to get back to the study of, of the Bible, one of the books of the Bible. And I said, well, let's do that. So I think that I can promise that much. No, we've done that for a long time. Well, we've been doing some doctrinal studies, and uh, I think they're more difficult. Yes, definitely. <laughs> well, they are, an inductive study of the scripture takes scripture and says, what can we learn from this? But it takes a doctrine and looks for all the scripture that support that doctrine that teaching. So I'm looking at some um, books that we haven't studied before. Out of the 66 books, we have not even done a dozen, I don't think. I don't have a list, but I don't think we've studied a dozen books in, in 11 years. Well, I'm not going to try and list them. I really appreciate your faithfulness. I hope you'll invite others to join us. You can, uh, if they're not getting the mailing, you can uh, let me know and I'll put them on the invitation list. And uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, we bring before you those who are ill amongst us. We ask you to comfort those who will mourn and tap to help each of us in our infirmities, because daily we have limitations and pains and digestive difficulties, and we ask you, please come and bring your healing to us and to those that are named on our, on our prayer list, that you will be helpful to them and to us. Teach us that we might be teachers of others, that we might understand what is understandable and accept by faith that which nothing but faith can understand. Hear us pray in the name of Jesus, our true and our only Savior who gave himself, really gave himself into death for our sins. In his name we make this prayer. Amen.